Thank you very much. Welcome back. And uh, okay, so what's the plan for today for this final uh, lecture overview? We have two aims today. Namely, one aim is to introduce you to motivic Donaldson Thomas invariants of quivers. And the other aim is to introduce you to cohomological Hall algebras. And the plan of the talk is well, we'll first have a, um, a section of three slides connecting what we will do today to the lecture yesterday to somehow explain again the logic of the series of talks. Uh, in the second part, I will introduce uh, these motivic DT invariants, first the, 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 their definition. And their definition is very mysterious, so I should, we should explore their nature. And then I want to give you some quite easy examples of them. And then in the final part, cohomological Hall algebras, which is some kind of categorification of several of the concepts we already uh, saw. And I will define them. I will show you a categorified wall crossing formula and discuss the structure of cohomological Hall algebras in some examples. Okay, so that's the plan for today. But uh, connecting to the talk yesterday, let me start with a slight correction. So this was one of the slides from yesterday. I introduced the Euler form, its anti-symmetrization, and uh, as, a, as a ring in which motivic wall crossing formulas work, I introduced the motivic quantum torus. This was a formal power series ring in as many variables as you have vertices in your quiver. And the base ring is this localized ring of motifs where invariants of algebraic varieties live. And we have a multiplication which is slightly twisted. Then I defined certain generating functions in here. And uh, I om omitted something uh, quite important, namely to, uh, to, uh, for, for this to be a well-defined power series, we definitely need t to the power d. This was uh, missing in the slides yesterday. So please uh, uh, correct this. And with this definition, so this is a generating function somehow counting all representations. These are generating functions counting, in a sense, semi-stable representations. And then the Hadanera Simon filtration has a reinterpretation as this motivic wall crossing formula. A decomposes as a product over the rationals of these local series in this motivic quantum torus. Okay. Um, Right. Before I continue, I want to somehow discuss, uh, make an informal discussion of two different directions in which you can study quiver moduli spaces. At least that's somehow my impression that there are somehow two quite orthogonal directions in studying quiver moduli spaces, namely a horizontal direction and a vertical direction. This is, uh, this is not well defined mathematically, this is just somehow the, the intuition behind behind this, uh, this field of research. So let me call uh, the horizontal direction in studying quiver moduli spaces, the study of the moduli spaces for D indivisible and for uh, a generic theta, which may vary along stability space. And uh, so in this direction of study, you have very nice varieties. You have smooth, rational varieties. They're even projective if your quiver is acyclic. And please recall uh, smoothness of these moduli spaces, this very important fact that comes from D, the dimension vector being indivisible and the theta being generic. Yeah? So then you have very nice varieties. We can calculate the Betty numbers using the wall crossing formula. And we can even study finer geometric properties. Like we have seen yesterday, nice resolutions of singularities. We have discussed Fanoness in the um, and in the uh, sessions with questions, there was uh, the qu uh, question on uh, what about sheaves on, on these moduli spaces, what about the derived category of coherent sheaves. These are all things which can be studied in this horizontal direction. And then there is some of the per uh, perpendicular vertical direction. Study these moduli spaces for a fixed theta and for all D of a fixed slope. And now important is for all D, for the divisible ones. And uh, this is much harder, I think, than the horizontal direction because you get highly singular varieties. Yeah? The smoothness you only have if D is indivisible, but now we are studying all D of a fixed slope. And so in particular, all multiples of a fixed D. So we have highly singular varieties. And now very informal statements, all known invariants seem to explode. So for example, in all the cases, I can compute the Euler characteristic um, increases exponentially uh, with D getting large. 
And um, the only thing we, we know is that all these invariants are somehow encoded in these local motivic generating series. That's why I put uh, lots of emphasis on, on this series. And finally, the question in this vertical direction is, what are the right questions? So which questions can you ever expect to answer about these uh, moduli spaces, these highly singular moduli spaces for all V? So um, a, a, lot of, a lot of time in doing research in this vertical direction, uh, I spend on asking myself, what is the right question, which one can potentially answer? All right, so this is, this is a very informal statement. And um, well, but anyway, that's somewhat my feeling that, the, that this, uh, the study of curve moduli spaces decomposes into these two orthogonal directions. And yesterday we concentrated on this horizontal direction, more or less. Yeah, we uh, assumed that D is indivisible quite a few times, and then we changed the theta. We came to these wall crossing formulas. So that was uh, uh, our direction of study yesterday. And today we will, uh, I would, would like to say a little bit about this uh, vertical direction, which is uh, much harder than the horizontal one. All right. And uh, well, okay, so this vertical direction, encoding the invariance of the moduli spaces means studying these motivic series. And these motivic series, I had the feeling uh, they somehow uh, came a bit unmotivated in my talk yesterday. So I would like to uh, show you one example of these motivic series, yeah, working in this motivic quantum torus and having motives as uh, the ring of motives as the base ring. Namely, our aim is very, very modest. Let's compute the motivic generating function for the quiver, which is just a single vertex. If we can understand this case, then, uh, then there's some hope that we can do something for, for other quivers. Yeah? So why not start with a quiver, which is just a single vertex, no arrow. Recall that this corresponds to the linear algebra problem of classifying vector spaces up to isomorphism. Yeah? So that's nothing to do from the point of view of linear algebra, except noting that the only invariant is the dimension of a vector space. Well, OK. So let's do this computation on, on this slide. And then we will somehow turn to these motivic Donalds and Thomas invariants. So that's the general definition of the, of the motivic generating series. It's one plus sum over all dimension vectors minus square root of the Lefschetz motive to the Euler form, motive of the representation space divided by motive of the group times variable t to the d. So that we have seen several times yesterday. OK, let's make this concrete in the case the quiver is just a, a single vertex. Uh, for the quiver, which is just a single vertex, the Euler form dd is nothing else than d squared. Dimension vectors are just uh, non-negative integers. The representation space is just a single point because the representation space encodes all the arrows making up a quiver representation. Well, there are no arrows here, so the representation space is just a single point. Well, very nice. And the structure group is just GLD. Okay, so we got rid of the uh, representation theory of quivers notation, and th this is just linear algebra notation. And now, in the next step, we will calculate these motives here. Here we continue. The motive of a single point is just one, the unit in this motivic ring. And the motive of the group GLD is written here. And this can be uh, explained as follows. So please recall that L to the D is nothing else than the motive of affine D space. Right? Affine D space. Now, how do you construct an element of GLD? How do you construct an invertible D by D matrix? Uh, let's look at this column by column. In the first column of your invertible D by D matrix, you are allowed to put any vector except zero. So uh, the number of choices is affine space minus one because uh, zero is not allowed. Then in the second column, you are allowed to put any vector except a multiple of uh, the vector in the first column, which gives you L to the D minus L and so on and so on. And what are you allowed to put in the last column of an invertible matrix? Any vector except anything which is in the span of all the other vectors. So a D-dimensional space minus a hyperplane. So this is a very quick argument why the motive of GLD is this uh, product. One has to be a bit more precise on that. 
But if you believe this calculation for a second, then what you see here is still an element in this motivic quantum torus, but it looks quite harmless. I mean, we just have a formal variable d t here and say a formal variable l here. Yeah, so this is an elementary series. Let's simplify it a little bit and then we arrive at this. One plus sum over d, l one half times t to the d divided by one minus l, one minus l to the d. Now, if you replace l by q, then maybe you know this series because it is uh, one of the sides in the so-called q binomial theorem. And the q binomial theorem tells us that one can factor this sum into an infinite product. It's the product over all k, and then it's the inverse of 1 minus l to the k plus 1 half times t. That's the constant of the so-called q binomial theorem. That's completely elementary. Uh, you can prove it combinatorially using counts of partitions or in many different ways. <clears throat> so this is our first example of a motivic generating series. We can compute the motivic, uh, motivic generating series for the trivial quiver as a nice well, quite nice infinite product over geometric series. Yeah, what you find here is something like a geometric series, one over one minus a monomial. All right, so the essential thing is that this is an Euler product factorization. Yeah, so we have a series which is defined as a formal power series, as an infinite sum, but we can nicely factor it into an infinite product in an elementary way. That's the essence. Okay. So this slide serves two purposes. One purpose is don't be afraid of motivic generating series. Uh, if you write it down in any concrete case, then, well, it's really possible to compute it and to bring it into some nice compact form. And the other purpose of this slide is uh, to show you the first example where such a generating series can be factored into kind of an Euler product because this is now uh, the entry point for motivic dt invariants. All right, so please remember you have this product factorization here. And let's go to the first uh, slide for motivic Donaldson Thomas invariants. So these were introduced by Konsevich and Zoyerman about 10 years ago. Uh, their motivation was from uh, BPS states counts in string theory. So they were trying to to make a string theoretic concept uh, precise in a mathematical way. And uh, what they actually do is factoring motivic generating series. So here's the precise definition. We fix the quiver Q as usual, a stability. We fix a certain slope. And now we make a very important assumption. Uh, uh, without this assumption, things uh, will not behave nicely. We assume that the Euler form of the quiver, remember, this was this non-symmetric bilinear, in general, non-symmetric bilinear form, which I introduced. I assume that this non-symmetric bilinear form is symmetric, actually, on the set of dimension vectors of this fixed slope mu. So to give you some idea about this condition, let's for a second assume that the stability is zero. Well, if the stability is zero, then the only possible slope is zero, and all dimension vectors are of slope zero, then this condition means the Euler form should be symmetric globally. And this means precisely that the quiver is symmetric, in the sense that you have as many arrows from i to j as you have arrows from j to i. Yeah? So globally, uh, Symmetry of the Euler form means that the quiver is symmetric, but here we have a local variant of the symmetry. We only assume that the quiver somehow behaves symmetrically on dimension vectors of a fixed slope. So that's a technical condition which we will, uh, which we have to assume all the time. And now, what Konsevich and Zoyberman define is an Euler product factorization, namely. Now this looks a bit frightening. Here it is. Oh, okay, so let's look at the ingredients. On the left-hand side, we have this motivic generating series. Let me quickly get back, get back to, the, to the definition. There we go. So the motivic generating series with a slope, indexed by a slope, is this generating series, but it only cares about the semi-stable representations 
of dimension vectors of a given slope. Yeah, so this is a series encoding all the semi-stable representations of a fixed slope. And this generating series, we try, now try to factor into a product over all dimension vectors of that slope, over all uh, integers i and all integers k. And then we have this expression one minus a monomial in L and T to a certain power. And we have put an alternating sign here. So what does this mean? Well, this means Given your data Q and the slope, take this motivic generating series, write down such a factorization. And it's elementary to see that such a factorization always exists for some numbers CDI, depending on the dimension vector and an, an integer i. Yeah? So the reason is just that AQ mu is a formal power series with constant term one. And any formal power series with constant term one admits such a brute force factorization. But in general, you don't know anything about the CDI. There may, might be some just rational, uh, rational numbers. Okay, and let's now assemble these CDI into polynomials. Namely, for any D, we assemble all the CDI for varying E, I in a, in a polynomial, in a Laurent polynomial. And uh, these are called the motivic Donaldson Thomas invariants of the quiver. All right, so that's the formal definition. That's the precise definition of these motivic DT invariants. But obviously, you can't see uh, too much from this definition. And uh, you really need to know the long story before uh, how you come to this definition from BPS state counts and from whatever uh, Euler product factorizations are known. So at the moment, this definition is completely unmotivated, but well, that's how they are defined. So the idea is to write down a nice infinite, a nice formal power series encoding semi stable representations of a fixed slope. You do a brute force factorization into an Euler product. And you assemble all the exponents which you have into a series of polynomials. And now, uh, yeah, the promise is that these polynomials are actually interesting. And uh, actually, we will correlate this uh, later with our, diff with our um, factorization here, like we did for the trivial quiver. For the trivial quiver, we actually obtained such a factorization. And we'll later see what this means for the DT invariant. So here's the, the general form. So that is, unfortunately, the definition of DT invariants. So what is the nature of these DT invariants? Because from the definition, it's absolutely not clear what is the nature. These are just some more or less random numbers, if you look at this definition. And we just have to uh, trust Kosevich and Soiberman that they are reasonable. So now let's explore the nature. So first of all, there's a theorem by uh, Efimov. If your quiver is symmetric, so you have the same number of arrows from i to j as from j to i, and your theta is trivial, then these motivic dt invariants are actually polynomials with non-negative coefficients if you make the correct choice of variables. So they're actually, a priori, they're just Laurent series, Laurent series uh, with non-negative coefficient in the variable minus L one half. Forget about this. This is just a technical issue at the moment. Uh, well, so anyway, the most important thing is the DT invariants are polynomials with non-negative coefficients. And if you have a polynomial with non-negative coefficients, then this usually means this polynomial is counting something, or it is the Poincaré polynomial of some graded vector space, where whatever, it has some meaning. Whenever you have uh, such non-negative integers popping up naturally, they have to have some meaning. They should count something, some fi finite sets, or they should be the dimensions of certain natural vector spaces. So they definitely should, uh, should be something important. So that's the first confirmation of the hope of Konsevich and Soibermann that these DT invariants are something natural, yeah? It is encoded in this non-negativity. And uh, well, this hope actually turned out to be true 
Based on this theorem, together with Sven Meinert, I proved um, the following formula for these dt invariants, or, well, formula, the following geometric interpretation. Here it is. And uh, it's, again, a huge formula. Formulas will become shorter once we categorify. Uh, but uh, let's just enjoy the formula at the moment. So we proved that this dt invariant is, in fact, nothing else, just look at this term, as the Poincaré polynomial of the moduli space we are all interested in, uh, in, intersect in compactly supported intersection cohomology. Well, again, you have to uh, look at this polynomial in the variable minus square root of L, and there's a certain twist factor, minus square root of L to the power dd minus one, but uh, forget about this in first approximation. So essentially what it says that essentially the dt invariant is the Poincaré polynomial in intersection homology of these moduli spaces. And this confirms that these dt invariants, although their definition is something completely formal, just taking a generating series and factoring it into an infinite product, that these formally defined polynomials actually have a geometric meaning. They are Poincaré polynomials in intersection homology. So this theorem is true if there exists a stable representation of this dimension vector. If there's no stable representation, uh, the dt uh, polynomial is zero. So that's our theorem and is essentially based on, on uh, Efimov's um, theorem and many reductions from the general situation to the symmetric situation. I don't want to comment on the proof because um, oh, it's really uh, tough work and we somewhat just got through and uh, since then I don't want to touch the proof of this theorem anymore. All right. Okay, so let me again explain the logic. The logic is we define these dt invariants completely formally. This has nothing to do with geometry or representation theory. Completely formal, you take a certain power series, factor it into an Euler product, and then you have certain exponents appearing. You gather these exponents in polynomials, and then you hope that these polynomials mean something. And actually they do. These polynomials are Poincaré polynomials in an appropriate uh, cohomology theory. All right. Time for examples of these dt invariants. Uh, let's again start with the trivial quiver, which is just a single vertex. In this case, well, we just take the stability to be zero. So we just want to uh, somehow correlate the form of this, the product, Euler product form for the motivic generating series, which we already found on this first example page. We want to correlate this with the dt definition. So the fact that the motivic generating series is this means precisely the dt invariant in dimension one is one and the dt invariant in all other dimensions is zero. Because, um, okay, so let me, no, okay. Because, well, in this product factorization, you don't have terms t to the something appearing. You just have t in the first power, and that means only the dt1 polynomial appears, and it is 1, and all other are 0. Okay, let's compare this to the structure of the moduli spaces. The moduli spaces of semi-simple representations, this is something we know from the very beginning, the moduli space of one-dimensional representations of the trivial quiver is a single point, and all other moduli spaces are empty. Okay, and this correlates with the dt invariant here being one and all the dt invariants here being zero. Very nice. And now I'm just thinking um, I made a mistake here. So, sorry, this should be... This should be also a single point here. Okay, so let, let me do the next example to clarify things. Sorry for that. I will, I will, okay, I will continue talking and think about whether this is a mistake or not. Okay, so as a second example, let's look at, at the single loop quiver. And recall from the very first lecture, the single loop quiver, that's the problem of considering matrices up to conjugation, one matrix up to conjugation. 
and we know what the moduli spaces of semi-simple representations are, we saw that the quotient map is given by attaching to a matrix its characteristic polynomial, or more precisely, the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, so that we know the moduli spaces. And uh, again, let me first work out the motivic generating series, and then its Euler product factorization. Let me then read off the DT invariants and compare them to the moduli spaces of semi-simples. So that's the motivic generating series for the single loop quiver after some elementary reformulation. So it's one plus sum over all D, L to the D, D minus one half, uh, divided by 1 minus L, 1 minus L to the D, and then minus LT to the power D. And now there's another variant of the so-called Q binomial theorem, which gives an Euler product factorization for this series. Here it is. The Euler pro product factorization this time is product of all K, 1 minus L to the K plus 1T, but now the power is 1 and not minus 1, like for the trivial quiver. So that's the, that's the essential difference. And carefully looking at the definition of the dt invariant, this interprets as the dt invariant dt1 is minus square root of L, and all the other dt invariants are again zero. Let's correlate this with the moduli spaces. The moduli spaces of semi Simples are just affine spaces, d-dimensional affine spaces, because the quotient map is given by attaching to a matrix the coefficients of its characteristic polynomial. But simple, uh, simple representations only exist in dimension one. And that was one of the contents of this uh, theorem of Sven Meinert and myself. I will uh, show it to you again in a, in a second. So the first dt invariant is minus L to the one half, corresponding to the fact that the moduli space of one dimensionals is an A1, an affine line. And all these uh, others are zero because uh, for d greater or equal to, you have a moduli space, but it does not contain any simple representation. Yeah? So it doesn't match the expected dimension in a sense. So let me briefly scroll back to the main theorem. Here it is. So the dt polynomial encodes the uh, intersection homology of the moduli space if there exists a stable representation and otherwise it is zero. Sorry, okay. And uh, while talking, I realized that indeed I made a mistake here. The moduli space in the first example is also a point for d greater or equal two. And I will correct this in the, uh, version of the slides, which will be distributed. All right, so one more example, and then we are finished with the numerical part. Uh, what about the double loop? Well, for the double loop, we have uh, an unsolved linear algebra problem, and we have these highly non-trivial moduli spaces. So the only thing we can do here now is uh, that I can repeat from the second lecture uh, a certain Rogers Ramanujan type identity. So that's something I already wrote down in the second lecture. So for the case of the double loop, the, the motivic generating series after some reformulation looks like this. And if you omit the T to the D, that's precisely one of the Rogers Ramanujan series. The T we have this form of variable T. And then we write, want to write down an Euler product factorization and in its shortest form, it looks like this. We take the product of all positive B, product, uh, product of all non-negative I, product of all non-negative K, one minus a monomial. And then the power of, of this one minus monomial, which you have to take, involves again the dimension of an intersection homology group for the moduli space of semi-simples. So these moduli spaces of semi-simples, these were these moduli spaces encoding uh, simultaneous conjugacy of matrices. So that's, uh, so that's where this formula from the second talk came from. Wow, okay, so that was lots of formulas. And uh, now uh, we'll come to the second part of the talk, which is on, on cohomological Hall algebras. 
then we will categorify everything and the formulas will look much smoother. So maybe this is the right point for having a short break. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Uh, there is one question from Lang Mu. Mm -hmm. uh, can you unmute yourself or should I ask the question? Okay, I... Oh, yes. Okay, here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, just muted myself. <laughs> okay, uh, so I have a question. Uh, so in all the uh, situations we discuss here, we always assume that uh, if we fix a uh, stability condition theta, and yeah. then all the dimension vectors such that um, uh, with the same slope with respect to theta. Exactly. We always exactly. assume that it's symmetric. The, the form is symmetric, right? Yeah, right, Even right. You, 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 you fix the, the stability, you fix the slope, and you only look at the, uh, at the set of dimension vectors of that fixed slope, and you always have to assume that the restricted Euler form on this uh, sub lattice is uh, symmetric, yes. And the DT, multivec DT invariance are only defined in this case? Uh, Sorry? In, so the multivec DT invariance are only defined in this case? Um, yes. <laughs> You could somehow uh, brute force define them in, in, in other cases, but it's definitely true that you will not get any uh, nice integers here or that they have some, some interpretation. Well, um, one reason is that, um, okay, <clears throat> I can explain you why it is not natural to do this in any other case. So what I'm doing here, I'm looking at this motivic generating series, and this is still an element of this motivic quantum torus, right? And let me briefly go back to the definition of this motivic quantum torus. Yeah. The motivic quantum torus was a formal power series ring over motifs. And the multiplication is given by a twist with the anti symmetrized Euler form. Yeah. So, in particular, it means this twist here vanishes, which means the motivic quantum torus will be commutative even only if the anti-symmetrized Euler form is zero, which just means that the Euler form is symmetric. And uh, what this means for our uh, definition of the T invariance is, in the case where the restricted Euler form is symmetric, the part of the motivic quantum torus where this series lives is actually a commutative ring. And this commutativity is a big advantage because, well, in this Euler product factorization, we don't care about the order of the product. And we don't want to care about the order of the project, product. Yeah? So the fact that I write down a an, an, uh, an product here without specifying any ordering, that's only possible because somehow locally, uh, this uh, motivic quantum torus behaves like a polynomial ring. And that's this symmetry condition. Well, without the symmetry condition, you could still write this down, but you have to decide about some ordering. But I think there are good examples that these CDI are no longer integers and that there are no good properties to expect. Yeah, okay, thank you. And maybe one more question? Yes, please. Um, so can you comment on the case where there exists a potential? For example, in a case where <laughs> there's a loop with uh, some po monomial potential? I can't, no. <laughs> um, well, well, many of, of these things uh, are originally defined by Konsevich and Zoebermann for uh, quivers with potential or more general three Calabiao categories. And uh, for example, this, this main result here by Sven Meinhardt and myself, that, uh, that's a theorem by Ben Davison and Sven Meinhardt in the three, three Calabiao case. But um, so yeah, expect many of these things to uh, hold in the three Calabi Yao case or in the case of quiver with, quivers with potential, but um, I don't have a good feeling for this case. So better ask Ben Davis and Sven Meiner. Sorry. No problem. Thank you so much. There are no further questions that I'm aware of. Uh, okay. So we, we can continue. Okay, great. So everyone's maybe happy to leave these formulas aside for, for some minutes. And uh, let's turn to categorification. So now our aim is to categorify wall crossing formula and the DT invariance via the so-called cohomological Hall algebra. 
And that's a gadget also defined by Kontsevich and Seubermann when they defined these motivic DT invariants in general. So these were somehow defined together with a potential uh, categorification. And uh, now, please keep in mind that we are still talking about these moduli spaces encoding linear algebra problems, but now we are really turning into uh, an, an direction of, of algebra which somewhat is of independent interest. So again we fix a quiver, a stability and a slope and let me first write down the global cohomological Hall algebra. Namely we take the sum of all the equivariant cohomology of all the representation spaces. So that brings us back to the beginning when we tried to uh, formulate, when we formulated this geometric approach to representations of curvas. The geometric approach was we have RD of Q, the representation space, which is just a direct sum of, homes of uh, spaces of linear maps, or which the group GD acts. And we know that the GD orbits in this space are precisely the isomorphism classes of curve representations. Now we are doing something different. We are taking the GD equivariant cohomology of the space, and then we are summing all them all up. Um, when you see this for the first time, this might be a a very uh, bad idea because that's equivariant cohomology of a vector space. And a vector space topologically is contractible. So you can just contract this guy here to a single point. And then we are just talking about the equivariant cohomology of a, of a single point. So in this thing here, the quiver itself at the moment doesn't play any role. Yeah, because you can always somehow forget about the quiver and completely contract this whole vector space to a point. So why is this a good idea? Well, the good idea is that you have a multiplication on this space, which depends on the quiver a lot. Namely, and I cannot define this multiplication, this will take uh, like five slides or so. It carries uh, a multiplication, which is something like parabolic induction or convolution along Hecke correspondences or whole algebra multiplication, however you would like to call it. But maybe keep in mind, it's something like parabolic induction construction. And it, so it carries a graded multiplication, turning this into an, uh, an algebra, an associative algebra, which has two gradings. One is a n to the q0 grading that comes from the dimension vector of the quiver. And the other n grading is the grading by cohomological degree. And this is, uh, this is actually highly non-trivial because this is equivariant cohomology. So it uh, usually lives in any positive degree. Yeah? So the underlying vector space of the coha does not at all depend on the quiver, but the parabolic induction type multiplication, that depends on the quiver. And what, this is why this gives some, something uh, very non-trivial, uh, although the definition looks Quite simple. All right, so you haven't seen the stability and the slope in this definition. That's the, the second part of the definition. Similarly, we can define the semi stable cohas, semi stable for a fixed slope. And that's some of the same as with the, generate, with the motivic generating series. We have seen one global motivic generating series, AQ. And we have seen these local generating series, A, Q, mu. And this is the local version. So the local coha for the slope mu consists of the direct sum over all dimension vectors of the fixed slope mu, sorry, of equivariant cohomology, but not equivariant cohomology of the whole representation, uh, representation space, but only the semi-stable part. So that's really in complete analogy to the definition of this motivic generating series. And here again, you'll have a parabolic induction uh, multiplication, and this is a uh, doubly graded associative algebra. So that's the coha. Take all the equivalent cohomologies and find some convolution along Hecke correspondences to define a multiplication on it. So what does this have to do with uh, motivic generating series and so on? So um, here's the lemma or the important observation. If you take the Poincaré series of this algebra, keeping track of, of both the gradings, 
then what you get is precisely the motivic generating series, in a sense. Uh, so this, without the brackets, just for COA of Q and AQ, this is, this is somewhat just a, just a lemma. It's more complicated if you keep uh, track of the semi-stability, but yeah, okay. So that's, that's the principle. The COA was, is a categorification of what we did before, of these motivic generating series, because the COA is a doubly graded algebra whose primary series is precisely this motivic generating series, which we found. All right, so uh, the title of this slide is wall crossing formula and our best uh, formulation for the wall crossing formula was the motivic generating series A is just the product over all the local series A mu, right? That was our shortest form of the wall crossing formula. And so here's the categorified wall crossing, which I proved together with Hans Franzen. The COA of Q can be decomposed into a tensor product over all rationals in decreasing order of these local coas of semi-stables. So that's in perfect analogy with the wall crossing formula, which said that the generating series AQ is the product of the A mu of Q. Unfortunately, this isomorphism is only an isomorphism of doubly graded vector spaces. It is not at all uh, uh, an isomorphism of algebras. Yeah? So COA has an algebra structure. Each of these local COA has, has an algebra structure, but these algebra structures do not fit together. Yeah? So the, the, the algebra does not decompose into a tensor product over, over these algebras. So that's huge, and you really have to think about a second how to well define an ordered product, uh, an ordered tensor product over all the rationals. But uh, actually, due to all these double gradings, it's possible to define it. And uh, well, okay, so that's the categorified wall crossing formula. And uh, then, of course, you might ask, okay, so if if the coha, if this algebra encodes the properties of these motivic generating series so nicely, then the question is, what is the structure of these algebras? And uh, so far, uh, the structure of these algebras is well understood in the case where Q is a Dinkin quiver by work of, in particular, Richard Rimani. And this is the case I will not discuss today because in the case of a Dinkin quiver, we have seen already in the, in the first talk, there are no interesting moduli spaces. And then I'm completely losing the connection to the moduli spaces. I will concentrate on these cases where there are interesting moduli spaces. And these are, well, there are more or less four examples of COHAS, uh, which I can compute. And I will tell you about all of them. All right, so that's the COHA. Now we come to the structure of the core and its relation to the DT invariants. So I call this theorem categorified DT invariants and it's, uh, actually it's due to Efimov and that's the way Efimov proved the positivity properties of DT invariants. So if your quiver is symmetric, then the Koha is a graded symmetric algebra of this very special form. That's the essence. So let's look at this, what this means. So V upper star star means V is a certain bi-graded vector space. Well, okay, the whole coha is bi-graded by dimension vector and by cohomological degree. So uh, we also have this bi-grading by dimension vectors and by cohomological degree here. So this is a bi-graded vector space. To this bi-graded vector space, we uh, just adjoin one formal variable z, which actually lives in degree zero two. I forgot to uh, to write this down. It always z. Whenever you see z now, it uh, lives in degree zero two. Okay, and then over this bi-graded vector space, you take the graded symmetric algebra. And uh, please be careful that this is a graded symmetric algebra. So a uh, symmetric algebra, you would usually expect to look like a polynomial ring, but this is a graded symmetric algebra over a graded vector space. So in even degree, it produces polynomial rings 
and in odd degrees it produces uh, exterior powers and so it produces um, yeah anti anti commuting variables we will see examples for this okay so Efimov tells us that if you have a symmetric quiver then we know completely the structure of the koha this koha is free it's just a free graded symmetric algebra over a bigraded vector space where you have one free variable lots of freeness in there and if you take this equality here this isomorphism here and compute Poincaré series on both sides, then you will see that Efimov's theorem about the positivity of DT invariance follows formally just from this isomorphism. Yeah? So this isomorphism, taking Poincaré series and keeping very carefully keeping track of all the signs and all the degrees, tells you that this DT polynomial of the quiver is nothing else than the Poincaré polynomial of this vector space this double graded vector space v d again with this strange choice of variables yeah okay so that's the first theorem on cohomological Hall algebras if your quiver is symmetric the coa is very free it's just a graded symmetric algebra all right there is a far-ranging uh, generalization of this uh, so the second theorem on categorified DT invariants due to Ben Davison and Sven Meinhardt. So again, let's assume we are in the case where the Euler form is symmetric on dimension vectors of a fixed slope. Um, yeah, somehow in analogy to the DT invariants, you would now expect that something similar here holds. Well, this is actually not the case. It's uh, much more indirect. In this case, you take the koha uh, of semi-stable representations for this fixed slope, and it is not a symmetric algebra, definitely not, but it admits a certain filtration such that the associated graded is again a symmetric algebra of the form of uh, Efimov's theorem. Uh -huh. So, this is almost like a <coughs> generalization of Efimov's very nice theorem on COAS. Yeah. So, in the non-symmetric case, choosing a slope for which the Euler form is symmetric, the COA is still related to a symmetric algebra on a, on, on a certain vector space, but only up to some, uh, a certain, up to taking an associated uh, graded. Um, Okay, so let me briefly comment on, on, on this extra ingredient here. Well, this filtration on the cohomological Hall algebra is defined geometrically. It's called the perverse filtration, and it really relates to the theory of perverse sheaves. And so even in very simple examples, I don't see a way of computing this filtration explicitly. So this seems to be very, very hard. And... Um, Okay, but anyway, it exists due to general perverse sheaf theory. And after taking this associated gradient of the core, you get a symmetric algebra. There are precursors for, for such a result. So this formally resembles one version of the poincare birkhoff witt uh, theorem in Lie algebra theory. If you take a Lie algebra and take its universal enveloping algebra, then this is uh, not a, a commutative ring but it admits a, a natural filtration, the Poincare bit of book of bit filtration. And after taking the associated graded, you get a free symmetric algebra over the Lie algebra. Yeah, so this is something like a Poincare book of bit type uh, theorem. And this in particular means that you can expect this koha to be something like a universal enveloping algebra, quantized universal enveloping algebra of some Lie algebra, and uh, this Lie algebra is something one really wants to know, but it will be a very complicated object. All right, so that's a comment on the algebraic uh, meaning of this theorem. And again, like an Efimov's theorem, if you now take just the Poincaré series of on both sides, then you are lucky that you get a, a concrete description of the T invariance, because taking the Poincaré series uh, doesn't see that you took the associated graded. All right, so that gives a categorification of the DT invariance in these vector spaces VDI 
which are the free generators for for this uh, for this core. So these are the general uh, general results, and now let's see the uh, the examples which one can compute. So examples of coas. <laughs> Again, let's start with the trivial quiver. And uh, in this case, the coha by general theory is uh, the symmetric algebra over a one-dimensional vector space in by degree one, one. And then you adjoin one variable uh, in degree zero, two. And so this is the case where you take a graded symmetric uh, algebra over, over a vector space concentrated in an odd degree. So what you get here is the exterior algebra in countably many generators. Is there a question, Peter? Or? No, okay. I'm good. Okay. No, no. No, okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So for the trivial quiver, the coha is an exterior algebra in countably many generators. That's already quite large, but it's at least an object we can uh, understand. Second example if Q is a single loop, then the coha is again a symmetric algebra, but now our one-dimensional vector space Q lives in an even degree. So the symmetric algebra is then really a symmetric algebra, again, in countably many generators. So these are the two first examples. For the trivial quiver, you get an exterior, countably generated exterior algebra. For a loop, you get a countably generated symmetric algebra. Note that these are two symmetric quivers. And now there is one more symmetric quiver for which the coha is completely known. And um, this is the case of the two cycle. I will show you this case and then try to correlate it again with the geometry of moduli spaces. But let me just mention these three examples, trivial quiver, loop, two cycle. These are the only symmetric connected quivers for which the coha is known, because these are the only symmetric connected quivers which are at most tame. All other symmetric connected quivers are uh, wild, and then we don't know the coha because we don't know all the dt invariants. All right, so that's the, uh, the most difficult example we, we can do of, of Efimov's theorem. In the case of the two cycle, the coha is again a symmetric algebra over a three-dimensional vector space. We see three copies of Q, and then again, adjoin, adjoining a formal variable of by degree zero two. And the three one-dimensional vector spaces sit in degree dimension vector one, zero, one, dimension vector zero, one, one, and dimension vector one, one, zero. <laughs> well, this looks like a quite random distribution of zeros and ones here, but uh, we can actually correlate it with the geometry of the moduli spaces. So uh, I, I completely forgot in my first talk to uh, discuss the, the two cycle, but actually if you look at the invariant theory of the, of the two cycle, then you will see that there are precisely um, three moduli spaces where you have simples, namely dimension vector one zero and dimension vector zero one, then the moduli space is a single point, and dimension vector one one, where your moduli space is an affine line. Yeah, if you go back to uh, to to my second lecture and look at the general theory um, of of these moduli spaces of semi simples, then you can easily reproduce this from the main theorem I formulated there because I forgot to do it for the two cycle. And now this beautifully correlates with this description of the coha. So these two moduli spaces being points correspond to these two vector spaces being concentrated in an odd degree. And this moduli space being an affine line corresponds to this generator in an even degree. And so that describes completely the structure of the coha and already tells you that it highly correlates with the uh, geometry of moduli spaces, again, which is to be expected because the coha encodes the dt invariants, but we also know that the dt invariants are related to the moduli spaces. All right, and uh, as I already told you, so these are the three symmetric quivers for which the coha can be determined. 
Then there is a class of, of curves for which the COA can be determined, namely the Dinkin curves. And then there's one more example where by now we know the complete structure of the COA, and this is the Kronecker quiver. And uh, this is actually the final slide. Uh, yes, okay. So let's look at the Kronecker quiver, two vertices and uh, a double arrow. And let's take the stability uh, one minus one. And now I will completely describe uh, the Koha based on the wall crossing uh, formula. We quickly go back to this. So the wall crossing formula, although it is only a decomposition of the Koha into these local Kohas as a vector space, nevertheless allows us to understand the full Koha by understanding these local pieces, these semi-stable Kohas for, for different slopes. And that's what we will now do for the Kronecker. And please go back. Okay, so in the case of symmetric quivers, we could describe the whole Koha because of the symmetry condition. But in the Kronecker case, we can only expect to have nice structural properties for these local Kohas for individual slopes. So, first of all, the Koha for a slope mu equals zero if your slope is not of the form minus one by an odd integer zero or plus one by an odd integer. And now you might wonder where do these uh, one, uh, one uh, by odd integers come from? Well, this you can easily explain yourself if you know about the representation theory of the Kronecker. Uh, in the representation theory of the Kronecker, you have indecomposer representations for the dimension vectors d, d plus one d plus 1d and dd. If you then calculate the slopes using the stability, then you will see that these dimension vectors here, they come from the pre-projective indecomposables. Uh, sorry, these slopes here come from the pre-projective indecomposables. These slopes here come from the pre-injective indecomposables. And the slope zero, that's the most interesting thing, that's the regular Okay, so if your mu is not one of this of this set of slopes, your local Koha is just the trivial ring. So if your slope is plus or minus one by an odd integer, then your Koha looks like an exterior algebra in countably many generators. So it's again a symmetric algebra over a one-dimensional vector space in odd degree and a joint Z. And the symmetric graded symmetric over this one dimensional vector space in odd degree, that was the uh, countably generated exterior algebra, like in the case of the trivial quiver. Okay, so the only remaining case is the Koha for the slope zero, where you have the interesting representations of the Kronecker quiver. And this algebra is actually very large. So it has two series of generators, E0, E1, E2, and so on, and F1, F2, and so on. And these generators are subject to quadratic relations. And now in this case, you don't get a symmetric algebra. Let me briefly go back to the general theory. For a symmetric quiver, we really get a symmetric algebra. But, for, but in this local situation, we only get a symmetric algebra after taking associated graded. So we expect to, be, to get something uh, non-commutative uh, generated by quadratic relations. And this is actually what happens. So the Koha for the slope zero has two series of generators subject to the following relations. Here they are. Okay, let's try to understand this. Well, actually, there are infinitely many generators and there are also infinitely many uh, relations, but I want to uh, somehow put these infinitely many, uh, infinitely many relations into, uh, into a more compact form, into three series. And to do this, I define generating series of these generators. So E of X is the sum of all N, the generator EN, and X is just a formal variable f of x is some of all n, fn plus one, and x is again just a formal variable commuting with everything you write down. 
And using this uh, generator, uh, generating series of generators form, there's the compact form for all the defining relations. The commutator of EX and EY equals twice Y minus X. And then you have something like a formal derivative of the E series and of the F series. If you commute the E series and the F series, you get the square of the formal derivative of the F series and all the F variables commute with each other. So to actually write down what this algebra is, what this algebra is, this COA zero, you take these three relations here, you plug in your definition of, of E and F, and then you compare coefficients. And you get three infinite series, three doubly infinite series of, of relations. And these are the defining relations for this COA. This is reminiscent to things which happen in quantum theory, a quantum group theory, when you define quantum algebras, or if when you define Yangian algebras, then usually also these algebras have infinitely many generators, infinitely many relations, and to somehow bring these infinitely many relations to a reasonable form, you take this approach via generating series, and this gives you a more compact form. Okay, and so, um, yes, this is the, the final example where the COHA is completely explored. Um, it's the Kronecker quiver, and we can only expect the COA to be nice on the local level for a fixed slope. And then we get slopes where the COA is trivial, slopes where the COA is just as the COA of a, uh, of a trivial quiver, uh, countably generated exterior algebra, and one new algebra uh, with these complicated, uh, infinitely many quadratic um, relations. And that's actually all the examples uh, we know at the moment. And there's lots of things uh, to explore about these cohas. But this uh, ends the talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus, for giving this beautiful lecture series. So let's thank Marcus. Uh, thank you. My Thanks. Even an actual clapper. Uh, are there any questions for Marcus? Any comments? Uh, yes, can I can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So this is Simon, by the way, you're speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so in these two theorems of Efimov and uh, Davidson Meinhardt, yeah. uh, is there any uh, geometric interpretation for this v v vector space? Uh, in Efimov's uh, theorem, uh, not at that time. What what uh, Efimov did was he looked at this uh, COA and uh, wrote down a Gröbner basis. And uh, using this group now basis, uh, prove the freeness. Yeah, so th this is completely algebraic. And uh, in, in the Davis Meinhardt theorem, well, there's actually more to this. They actually uh, show that these vector spaces, VDI here, and the structure of the COA are the uh, intersection homology groups. Yeah, like in, in this theorem of uh, Sven Meinhardt and myself where we had this interpretation of the DT invariants as front ray polynomials in intersection homology. So these V have an interpretation as intersection homology. And there's even an upgrade of, uh, of this to curves with potentials. So that's, that's the big one. <laughs> okay, thank you. There is uh, one question by Aurelio. Uh, mm -hmm. But who is having, he's having mic problems, so I will ask the question for him. Yes, please. Um, he asks whether you could say something about framed quiver representations and what is carried over from the GIT construction of the moduli spaces. Ah, everything, actually. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so let me, let me uh, talk about uh, framing and... Uh, so I don't don't have any tablet connected to uh, to my computer, so I just have to write some maybe some pseudo LaTeX code for for doing this. So uh, frame moduli spaces. Well, usually what you have is a your quiver, you have a dimension vector, and you have a framing datum n, which is also also a vector. And then you consider a situation like uh, you have your vector spaces. Vi, Vj, 
maybe VK. So, so this, is, this is the level of the, of the quiver Q. And then you want to, want to frame by, by some extra datum. Uh, and you have some additional vector spaces, WI, WJ, WK. But we still consider uh, only the action of, of the group G G of D for the original dimension vector. So we only consider the action um, of the GL of the VI. Yeah, and there's no, so, so that's the traditional definition of frame moduli spaces. You consider some additional uh, framing datum. And, but you still consider only the action of the group uh, GD, which is the product of the GL of the VI here. Um, but what you can do by uh, Bill crawley Bovis deframing trick is translate this into the situation where you just extend your quiver by one vertex let's just call it infinity and um, encode the framing datum n so the framing dating, datum n, that's somehow uh, encoding the, the vector spaces. It's actually fun. Uh, encode the n in arrows from inf t to, to the quiver q. And uh, then you have done deframing. So then the framed moduli space is just the usual moduli space for this extended quiver. Yeah, so all the, all the GIT construction of moduli spaces completely carries over to the frame space if first you perform the crawley booby deframing trick and, uh, and then you are done. So I think there's a paper of mine from 2004 called Frame Quiver Moduli and, uh, and something else where you can uh, see the details about this, about this trick. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, can you describe the cohomological whole algebra for uh, more general affine quivers? Not only um, oh yes, that, that's something I, sh I should have mentioned. Right. Let me uh, let me go back to uh, to this final slide with the with the Kronecker. So the techniques which we which we have would allow to get a similar description for all extended Dinkin quivers in principle. And uh, the only reason uh, that we didn't do it yet is that um, the description of this Koha zero really requires lots and lots of, of calculations. Okay. But, uh, but, but yes, I mean, you are, you are cordially invited to perform these calculations for the other extended Dinkin quivers. It would be really great because, um, I mean, yeah, calculations are terrible and I would really love to, to see someone doing it, yes. Okay, and maybe there is a, a preferred choice of stability. Uh, yes, in the, in, the, in, uh, in the case of a extended Dinkin quiver, there's always a preferred choice of stability. So if Q is extended uh, Dinkin, you have your imaginary root um, delta. And some of the canonical stability you should take is always taking the Euler form with, uh, with this delta, delta comma blank, or plus or minus, yeah? Okay. Plus, minus. <clears throat> so that is what is called in representation theory of extended Dinkin quivers, the uh, defect, the defect function. And this has very nice properties. Uh, it allows you to separate the pre-projective, pre-injective, and regular part, and that should be the stability which, which does the trick. Okay, then in any particular case, you, you should check that on any fixed slope, uh, your, your Euler form is symmetric, and so on and so on. I have to admit I never did this, but it sh should be known. And then you could start uh, to, to define, uh, to look at the generators and relations for these local cohorts. So it should be possible with enough uh, energy for all the computations, yes. Okay, and uh, if you choose, for example, uh, wheel quivers, but uh, very specific wheel quivers like uh, 
Kronecker quivers with three or more arrows? Yeah, so yeah, the, the first first example to look at would be the three arrow Kronecker quiver. Uh, so let's three, see. Um, so that would be the first case to look at and uh, to look at uh, dimension vectors which are um, proportional to 1, 1, for example. Yeah, so the, the, the simplest um, imaginary route. But even then, I have no idea what the curve should be. And I'm quite frightened to, to start the calculation because I, I know that the number of generators will explode exponentially with, um, with, with taking multiples of 1, 1. Yeah? Because the number of generators of this Koha should reflect the donaldson thomas invariance. And it is known that in this particular case, even the, the value at 1 of this donaldson thomas polynomial, uh, polynomial grows uh, exponentially with a, the with a dimension vector. Yeah, okay. and I see. Thanks. It would be terrible. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but that would be the dream of calculating this particular local coa. Yes, definitely. I see. Thank you. Uh, there is a follow-up question by Aurelio, and so he asks: In this deframing setting, yeah. is the action of the group GD extended to the extra vertex? Uh, no. Um, uh, okay. So so let me. Um, Give one more detail. Extend Q by one vertex infinity. Encode n x uh, say to Q tilde by one vertex. Encode n in the arrows and uh, and define d tilde the di dimension vector for this extended quiver as the original dimension vector. And on the new vertex infinity, you just put a one. And now I can explain what happens. Well, the new group acting is um, G of for this extended dimension vector G tilde, which is just the usual group GD. And now for this additional vertex, you just get one multiplicative group of your, oh, sorry, multiplicative group for your base fields. So you just get a copy of, of C star and this C star X trivially. And in this, in this way, if you have this group action on the extended quiver, you really get the original group action on here and no new group action on these on these vector spaces uh, w. okay thank you marcus uh, are there any other questions that should be asked in the recorded part that seems not to be the case so then we should thank marcus for the beautiful lecture series in which he gave blackboard talks <laughs> a Beamer talks and unexpectedly an ASCII talk. <laughs> and I should elaborate on that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this, this is amazing to see an ASCII talk. Uh, yeah, this is a, a whole new format for giving talks and it works remarkably well. People were surprised by how good it works. So thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> for your lecture series. And then we can stop the recording. All right.